So let's get into a topic near and dear to my heart, which is how property and casualty companies should invest. So as I mentioned last session, USA created this new department, Investment Strategy and Analysis. We called it ISA for short. Uh, I had a banker, had a, I mean, had a, um, a stock investor, had a real estate guy. I was there to be fixed income and I knew how to do efficient frontiers. Um, and they just said, you have one year, we need you to completely revamp how our investment portfolio works. There's a lot of debate at the time about whether or not USA should have real estate. We had a huge real estate portfolio, very uncommon for PNC companies. I was working in the investment company and the head of the investment company did not want any real estate. He wanted to sell it all and put it in stocks and bonds. And the head of real estate company thought we had a, we needed real estate, obviously. And so we had these three people together, two from the investment company, but my background was really more from the CFO and the capital corporation, the holding company, the head of equities, who was definitely from the investment company, and then the guy from the real estate company. And we were supposed to come together and figure out what was the best solution. Does it make sense for a company like USA that can experience huge catastrophes, earthquakes, hurricanes, to have this large illiquid asset like real estate? So that was what set up our department. The way my boss did it, he, he came, we came up with a list of all the factors to look at. It was a list, I think, of 18 things. It included things like taxes, um, included liquidity, uh, accounting aspects, what our peers were doing, uh, what rating agencies would say, what we rate, what regulations say. Uh, what's when we started off, the, one of the first things was the asset liability matching side of it. What assets should we own given the kind of liabilities that we have? There's a whole list of them. We took each thing on the list and we went through it in detail, read several articles. We created an article database where we read articles and rated them and summarized what their main findings were. Some articles we really loved and we actually liked so much that we would call the author of the article and have them speak to us over the phone and get more insight. It was a great job. I really enjoyed it. Um, and we got so much knowledge out of this that uh, I started going around the country, especially to rating agencies and presenting our findings so they could understand because no one had really done a study like that, at least not publicly. Maybe some other firms had done something internally. So it was fun. One year of doing nothing but just reading and debating. Uh, we found some pretty amazing things, especially on the tax side for USA. That was very, very unique. And I'd mentioned in a previous session how I pulled out, pulled in over 100,000 securities from our competitors. That's how I did the industry review. What are our competitors invested in? Uh, some of them, some of them are very, very heavy in the stocks, like State Farm. Some of them are very conservative and are mainly short-term, high-quality bonds, like Geico, because you know Geico. They're using their, PNC, their, their property and casualty auto insurance company is really funding for bigger projects outside of GEICO inside Berkshire Hathaway. So it was interesting. But what is the asset liability matching or management argument for PNC? On the live side, it drives everything. Interest rates, credit risk drive everything. On the property and casualty side, it's not quite that straightforward. You have to buy assets that are going to move somewhat with your liabilities. So if your liability suddenly jumped up 10%, you need an asset that's going to jump up 10%. So that's tough. On the life insurance side, most of their liabilities are very interest rate sensitive. So interest rates fall, their liabilities rise. Well, that's pretty straightforward. You buy bonds because bonds rise when interest rates fall. But PNC side is not so straightforward. Their liabilities don't jump up when interest rates rise. Their liabilities jump up when we have hurricanes or when people have more accidents um, or when asbestos is discovered, those kind of things. <laughs> so what assets should PNC insurance companies buy given their liabilities? So remember, we're looking at what drives frequency and severity. We're looking at accidents, storms, inflation for cars and home materials, medical cost inflation. There are a few investments that that respond in a high correlation to these type of things. So someone says, well, why don't you just invest in home builders? Well, first of all, it's too risky of a, an industry. There aren't that many home builders that are publicly traded. Most of them are small mom and pops. But you also think about, we're looking at the cost of rep 
repair, rebuild a house, some of that is the home builders and their profits, but they're also buying stuff like timber and bricks and concrete. If those prices go up, they're just going to pass that on as part of their, their, their cost of construction. And so if you buy the home builder, if, if con concrete prices, steel prices, wood prices have gone up, it's part of their cost of goods sold. Their, their profits won't shoot up with those costs. So you may not actually get much of a correlation there. On the medical costs, do you want to really invest in hospital and most medical service firms? It's the same issue there. It's just because medical costs are going up doesn't mean hospitals and medical device companies that their profits are going up. It could be that just the cost of their business is going up. If you're worried about inflation, you could buy TIPS. TIPS are inflation-protected treasuries, but they cover CPI, which is Consumer Price Index. They, they don't cover specific inflation related to the cost of cars and homes and medical costs. And in fact, if you think about it, a big part of CPI is oil, oil prices and gasoline prices. Well, as, as we know, when gasoline prices shoot up, people drive less. So there's a case where you know, it might be the op exact opposite. Oil prices, gas prices fall, so people drive more, you have more accidents. So it may actually go in the wrong direction. Uh, so there's tremendous what we call basis risk. There's a good chance tips will be falling in value at the same time your liability is going up. So that doesn't help you much. Inflation is the key. And so I want to talk about bootstrapping. We'll do it next session, next class. So I do want to do that. It'd be, you know, we have after after this session, we have um, we have three more classes after this one. We'll spend one of them talking about bootstrapping the yield curve, at least one session or one of them. So I do want to come back and do that. I think this is a good class to talk about bootstrapping yield curve. It's a really powerful thing to be able to do. <clears throat> so uh, we'll talk about that. I might simply use the videos I've already created because I think they're in pretty good shape. And then you'll have an exam question that does that. It should be a straightforward exam question because uh, everything's going to be open notes. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> so let's talk about what PNC insurance companies actually invest in and see if we can come up with a good rationale coming from the business, from the liabilities or any other part of the business. So PNC insurance insurers mainly buy bonds. That's their largest allocation. We saw that with with um, with Allstate, big part of their business, I think it's you know 60% of their investments were were corporate bonds or bonds at least. They they do buy treasuries, but they tend to buy corporate bonds more than treasuries, mainly because you get the higher yield. I'll talk about this in my risk management class, or we did talk about it in my risk management class. The yield to get on corporates more than covers the historical default risk. They are less liquid, so that's an issue. Now we'll have to talk about liquidity. Obviously, if you're exposed to hurricanes and earthquakes, you need liquidity. You need assets you can sell quickly. So corporates aren't quite that kind of asset, but they, they are, they're liquid enough. If you have a major hurricane, you're not going to have to pay everything out tomorrow. You usually have three or four months. So you can usually sell corporate bonds over that time frame, unless you're in a situation like we are right now or like in 2008 when you have a... A, a liquidity crisis and it just can't sell bonds. So th there are those type of issues. Now, corporate uh, PNC insurance companies buy a lot of municipal bonds. They may be the biggest investor in municipal bonds. And that really comes to the tax code. The tax code really encourages PNC insurers to buy municipal bonds, not life insurance. Life insurance, com life insurance companies almost never buy municipal bonds. The tax code for life insurers is maybe the most complicated tax code there is out there for insurance companies in general, very complicated. And when you work through that tax code, you'll discover why life insurers get very little benefit from buying municipal bonds. But property and casualty companies do. They are illiquid. They're probably more illiquid than corporate bonds because there's a lot of small mom and pop investors buying municipals. And if you think about it, because PNC is one of the main buyers of municipals, if we have a large, and, and just if you're not aware, municipal bonds t are tax exempt at the federal level. And they're also tax exempt at the state level for the states that have an income tax. So they're tax free securities. So if you think about it, PNC companies buy a lot of this, they're one of the biggest investors. Think about what happens if you have a major hurricane or major earthquake. If this industry, 
needs liquidity and they're one of the biggest buyers of these bonds and these bonds are illiquid, think about the disaster of them trying to sell a large portion of these bonds. I saw Allstate at one time where it looked like they had 40, 50 percent of their bonds or their investments were in municipals and I just thought, wow, that seems really pretty crazy because the, that's going to create quite the liquidity crisis. Corporate bonds, you can actually borrow against corporate bonds fairly easily. There's a thing called the, the repo market, and uh, it's, it's actually corporates work pretty well. They're not as liquid as treasuries in that market. Municipals, not so much. Look, municipals are a hard uh, bond to borrow against. So you're really looking at the after-tax yields. The municipals are better than corporates, and so they buy a lot of these. Treasuries and agency bonds, PNC companies do buy a lot of these, not as much as corporates and municipals, but they do put 10, 20% in this. Life insurers absolutely do not buy treasuries. Treasury bonds are way too low yielding for the type of business. You know, life insurers are paying interest on annuities and life insurance that need to be very competitive. They got to be competitive with bank CDs and with other insurance companies. So they have to pay a pretty high yield. And if you take my life insurance class, I show you that if you buy treasuries, you lose money in life insurance. There's just no way to make it. But PNC companies do buy, and that's where their liquidity came from, and that's what we looked at. We wanted to make sure we had enough in treasuries and agencies to cover a major catastrophe. So that we and we might not sell them. Treasuries are really easy to borrow against. They're very in, in the repo market. They're huge. Uh, in the securities lending market, they're very huge, so they're very easy securities to borrow against. So you don't even have to sell them. You can just borrow against them, pay your claims, and you're good. Mortgage-backed securities as well. Uh, insurance companies tend not to buy a large percentage of these, uh, but they are very liquid, and, and they can work. Life insurers don't like these because of the negative convexity of these bonds. Junk bonds, PNC don't buy as much junk bonds as life insurers do. So we saw Allstate, they may have had as much as 5% in junk bonds. Life insurers might have 10-15% in junk bonds because life insurers are stressing for yield. PNC companies, not as much. It, it's there, but it tends not to be as much, especially when you look at it not as a percent of investments, but as a percent of net worth. Life insurance companies have much less net worth than PNC companies. Life insurers may have $10 in net worth for $100 of assets. PNC companies probably have forty dollars in net worth for hundred dollars of, of assets, and so when you look at their junk bonds as a percentage of net worth, it's not as big. So the liquidity part of the liability really comes in, and the fact that PNC companies do buy a lot of treasuries and agencies to provide that liquidity buffer in case of a major catastrophe. Now PNC companies do buy publicly traded stocks. It's all over the place, like I mentioned. Uh, Allstate is probably one of the higher allocations with about 10%. State Farm was really high. They had 30, 40% in stocks at one time, which is really quite crazy, I think. This doesn't make sense. USA was somewhat in the middle of the pack, and then Geico had very, very little, so it's it ranges pretty wide. Life insurance companies do not buy stocks. It's just too risky for their business. I know life insurers, if you take that class, we talked about var variable products like variable universal life and variable annuities. Those have stocks, but they're not on the insurance company's books. They're in a separate separate set of books. So you'll see very, very little, if at all. Most life insurance companies have zero in publicly traded stocks. All of their stocks is in subsidiaries. So why do PNC insurers argue for stocks? There, there has been an argument that, that stocks provide some inflation hedge and plus, PNC companies have more net worth, so they can take a little bit more risk on the asset side. It depends on what the inflation is. If it's demand pool inflation, you have inflation because the economy is strong and consumers are spending. That tends to work well. If it's cost push inflation, that's because inflation is going up because oil prices are going up or because there's high inflation, like the 70s, where you saw inflation going up, but, it, but stocks did not perform well because their margins were getting squeezed. That inflation would not work well. And so that's one scenario where the insurance industry, oil prices go up. Their stocks will probably not do well. We, the day I'm doing this video, oil prices drop dramatically and stock market dropped dramatically. Um, but the PNC industry, you know, they're, they do have to worry about oil prices when they fall because people drive more. We're definitely not seeing that right now. So we're, we're all over the place. It's a very difficult industry to really model from an investment asset allocation standpoint. 
but stocks are very liquid securities. You may not think that because their prices are so volatile, but by liquid, what I mean is selling. I've sold as much as a billion dollars in stocks in one phone call, and my sell of the stocks, I was doing indexes, so indexes you can do a lot, but my $1 billion sell did not move the market. It was hardly even a blip. And now if I'd sold a billion dollars of one stock, like Apple or Walmart, it probably would have had an impact. But even then, you can you can do these sales. With, if that, there's, there's high liquidity in these markets. You can sell, and your sell doesn't drive the stock market, the stock market price down. Versus trying to sell a billion dollars of corporates, you will probably move the price of those corporates down. It's not that liquid. So PNC companies have large subsidiaries. These are not really investments as part of their overall business. Um, rating agencies do not like subsidiaries. They call it pyramiding of capital. That is, you're counting the net worth of a subsidiary as part of your net worth when really they need that net worth for their business. And so most rating agencies essentially write off subsidiaries to zero. They, zero. they don't count them at all. Commercial mortgages are pretty rare. It's a heavy allocation in life insurance because they need the yield. P insurance, PNC insurers do not do much because they tend to be pretty illiquid. Real estate is also pretty rare other than the company owned real estate. So USA is very rare in this industry having a large allocation to real estate. We saw Allstate had some real estate, but it was still a fairly small portion of their investment portfolio. Life insurers don't do a lot of real estate either. Most of the real estate that they get from life insurance companies is real estate they got because the commercial mortgage loan went default. And so they picked up the real estate kind of in a really bad way because their their leasee couldn't pay their lease. It's just real estate is just too illiquid for PNC companies. Now USA got away with it because USA had a lot of extra liquidity in other places and USA had a lot of net worth. And USA's real estate has really served it well. They, they started off poorly. They did some really bad investments, whether you're looking at Fiesta, Texas or the USA Towers. But uh, when Ed Kelly came along and Pat Duncan those two really good real estate people turned that whole thing around and you can see the incredible company that the USA real estate company has become. I know if you drive down I-10, you'll just see their buildings everywhere. While, while Fiesta, Texas has not worked out well for them, the whole La Cantera area and the, and the mall and all that has worked out well. They've really done well in that area. So USA has benefited from that and that was one of my recommendations that USA should stick with the real estate that it has. It has the room to do it and its net worth. And it's actually providing tremendous diversification to USA's overall investing. And so um, my former boss from the investment company wasn't too thrilled with that. But the, uh, the CEO and CFO of the real estate company, I think I was their favorite person there for a while uh, because I fought hard that we keep, keep that investment there. Um, other type of investments, private equity. USA had maybe $300 million in private equity. It's not too much. Allstate does do quite a bit of that. Um, derivatives, USA, we did derivatives. I used a lot of stock options in the 2008 crisis. It really helped us out well. Allstate was using options in the 2008 crisis. Joint ventures, other, you'll see some of that. That was that schedule BA. Uh, so you'll see some of it, but bottom line, PNC companies are heavy in municipals because of the tax reasons. They're heavy in treasuries, mortgage, well, not heavy mortgage backs, but the combine all of these together. Treasuries, mortgage backs, and agencies, they do that for liquidity and also because they work really well for securities lending, which is a really fast way to get cash. They're heavy in corporate bonds for the yield, not so much as life insurance. They have some junk bond, but not nearly as much as life insurers. They're heavy uh, in stocks for inflation protection. Um, there really is no great obvious answer for PNC companies when it comes to the investment side, and that's why you see their alloc their investment allocations radically different than uh, than um, between each other versus life insurers that all pretty much do very similar things. All right, so that's it for this class. Next class, the first session, we'll start there. So our next class, I'm just going to type there so my my Word document remembers to start there. Next class, we'll do the, the YouTubes. I don't know if I'll create new YouTubes or just use the ones I already have existing. So we'll see on that. Um, and then that will be an exam question. So you'll you'll have good, good practice on that. All right. So that's it for investment, investing for life insurance companies.